This actor was interviewed once and they said, What's your, what is your best work? He said, after we wrap and I'm in the car driving home. <laughs> That's the way I feel now. I'm going to think of a, great, a, a dozen fucking things to say. What, it's only 9.30. I remember when I first started, I, I, I got myself an agent and, um, and uh, I said, should I have pictures made? And he said, sure, I have pictures made. Then the people who don't want to see will know who it is they don't want to see. Okay. I remember sitting right here the night of the second year production of, uh, of um, Scarecrow, and I had the lead, and looking in that mirror and thinking, what in the name of God are you doing here? I'd never been an actor before I came here to the playoffs. I started late at age 26. And I'm right here thinking, as this close to saying, I'm getting the hell out of here, just jumping up and taking off. And uh, never been so terrified in my life. As I recall, I made the entrance onto the stage through a hole in the, in the floor, which I think was right around in here somewhere, and had to crawl up a ladder and shoot out of a hole out of a well, it's supposed to be like a, a, a well of water or something and play the devil dickin. My mouth was so dry I could barely, from fear, I could barely talk. I was talking, whistling. Every little. Burt Lancaster S. terrified for the first five minutes. And then, okay. Then it was okay. I've never been so terrified in my life. That's a good question. No, that, that's, no, that's a good question. <laughs> um, um, why did I get into acting? No, why, why, no, why did you want to become an actor? Well, that, uh, that's a good question, Dabney. Is that your name? Mr. Coleman. <laughs> uh, comfortable. That's a good question because uh, I didn't become an actor until I was, what, uh, like about 35 years old. So I graduated from high school when I was 18, 18 and 12, maybe it was, uh, maybe I was 32 or 33. And I, uh, I believed that I had a better chance of being knighted by the Queen of England than ever being an actor. That's how far-fetched the idea of being an actor was. I mean, if you're a kid in the town of Austin, New York, 15,000 people, and you're standing there on the street corner with your buddies, if somebody said something, you've got to be an actor, everybody would roar. You know, they go down on their knees laughing in the gutter. I didn't know anything about I, I always kind of had the, you know, a fantasy about being an actor, I even did. when I was a musician. Yeah. But I didn't really know anything until I went to the Naywood Playhouse. And yeah. Sandy Meisner was the guy who opened the door uh, to culture to me and, and gently nudged me through. I didn't know anything other than jazz and, uh, and uh, smoking grass before, before that time, you know? But when I saw, the, we saw the possibilities. That's one of the things I owe him so much for, for Presenting the possibilities of a, of, a, of a rich life and other values. He, he did that for me. And I'll, I'll never forget it. I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't think there's a day goes by that I don't think of him. Well, I went, I went from uh, a lot of abuse. At the University of Miami, I did Friends, Romans, Countrymen from Julius Caesar. That's all I did. And the, and the head of the department saw, said, if you work hard, you, 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 could really have a, you could really have yourself a career, said something like that. That was all I did there. And then from that point, I went to the Pittsburgh Playhouse where all I heard was abuse. Then I went to someone else who I don't even want to mention the name just because she's deceased, where all I heard was abuse. And then I got to Lee Strasberg, who actually would use me as an example of what you should be doing. And one week I wasn't there. I don't know if you ever met him, but he was a guy who would back up two feet. He made Woody Allen look gregarious. And he would back up two feet if you got anywhere near him. And he'd walk over to me 
shake my hand and say, uh, I missed you last week. I said, oh, I was so-and-so. And, you know, that was just so, so not him. So he was the one that gave me a lot of uh, support. But that was it. He was the only one, aside from the fellow at the University of Miami. So, but, but to me, uh, you know, I wrote this the first book I wrote called It'd Be So Nice If You Weren't Here. It's all about what do you do when they say go away? Because that's all they ever said was go away. But I don't think they know what they're talking about. Not just teachers, producers, casting. They don't know. There's so many gifted people that were in acting class with me. I never saw them get a job. Just because you're gifted, that, that you, you need somebody sitting looking at you who knows what they're doing. And sometimes it's right in front of them and they don't know it. They wouldn't even know it. There's a famous story about Alan Arkin. He, he did a pilot at one point. The director said, look at this guy. He's brilliant. The producer's looking at the same thing. says, I don't see a thing. So you need somebody who's looking at it as well as the person to be good. And I, I, I just can't get over how many people I know that were just, even at the Pittsburgh Playhouse way back there, that were so good. Uh, never saw them. Never saw them work in television, theater, movies, anything. Well, the first thing I remember, I, mean, I used to go and see westerns and I'd come out, and when I was 10 years old, I'd come out and get a hat and make it like a cowboy hat. <laughs> I mean, I had a bent for it, I think, when I was a kid. But uh, I, did a, I was in a speech class at the University of Kentucky, and um, it was connected with the uh, community theater and the college. And the speech teacher was a real good speech. That's where I lost my uh, Kentucky accent. <laughs> what did that sound like? Do you remember? I, you want me to do it now? Yeah. I'm talk, This is the way they talk right now. Uh -huh. Flat vowel sounds and mother and father hard R's like in Texas. And uh, hard, all flat vowel sounds and hard R's. Just, it's, it's the way, just the way I'm talking right now. <laughs> and and you and you learned to, to, to lose that. I lost that in college. Why did you want to lose it? Um, uh, why do I want to lose it? Yeah. I want to uh, I want to sound intelligent. <laughs> I I don't know. I I don't remember why. I, want to lose. I think I might have been thinking about it was all evolving and without me even knowing it, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, he was the speech teacher and he also was a director and he put me in Pygmalion, in the Shaw, uh, Shaw play. Spanky, sit the fuck down. Come here. Right. <laughs> Leave this in. And, and, uh... And, uh... Now you can get down now. Come here. <laughs> He's a great dog. Come here. Come here. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, he put you in it, I mean... But yeah, I played Alfred Doolittle, the mother, uh, father of Eliza Doolittle, with a Cockney accent. I had a good ear then, I was, I had a good ear, I just had a good ear. I've always been a singer too, I was singing when I was six years old, when everybody would leave the house. <laughs> so, singing and the singing, and the, I think it just evolved into that, it, performing artist, you know. Nobody wants to look through glass to the end of their life. No, nobody wants to look straight through a piece of plain glass and see the end of their life. I mean, the, the idea that you know every single day that what's going to happen to you and who you're going to be. I, I have this one life, right? I'm this 73-year-old guy, white, you know, elderly, married guy with so many kids. That's the one life I can ever have except when I act or direct then I can have a million other lives. So that's the biggest reason for me. Sure, there's an aspect of narcissism to it because it calls attention to yourself. Uh, there's no question that you're up on a stage performing and the lights are on you and people are looking at you and that's satisfying. But I think it goes a little bit deeper than that. I think it has to do with... Um, the ability to live more than one life, literally. I mean, I can be a, I can be a murderer. I can be a prince. I can be a, a battered housewife. I can be all of these things by reading literature, or by directing, or by acting. It can happen with reading too. You don't have to be an actor to do it. The acting part of it is a little bit of look at me, look at me. I suppose, but I don't think that's. 
I don't think that's all of it. Uh, a lot of the rest of it is just experiencing all of the other stuff that you're going to experience. You know, what is it like to be a killer? What is it like to be a slave? What is it like to be a prince? What is it like to be Hitler? What is it like to be? How do you play that? Where, where do you find that in yourself? And what what you know? I think it's the reason that most artists tend to be liberal uh, as opposed to conservative. Uh, you know, there are more conservative liberals and there are more liberal conservatives, but it's, it's very hard to, to walk in other people's shoes and not have a little more understanding of what it's like in a certain way. If you spend your life being other people and trying to see the world through their eyes, in some way, all liberal arts teach you compassion. They can't avoid that, you know, and then that's the good part of it, is that you can't experience being someone else without learning something about that. It's just impossible if you really do it well. The other part of it is great. The fact that, you know, you go in the red carpet and then all that bullshit that happens, that's, that's, that's a big part of it too, sure. Everybody loves that up to a point, but, but, but I don't think that's the main thing. Sometimes it starts with that. I think when you're a little kid it starts with that. Ooh, it's this nice, they're all applauding and looking at me and I like this, I'm going to dance and I'm going to do this, I'm going to make people laugh. And I think that continues, but then if you deepen and grow as a person, there are other things that become attractive about it to you, the pure artistry of it, and getting better at it, and what you learn from it. Well, one of the great things for me about directing is, is the education I've gotten from it. I mean, I, you, you can't, I, you couldn't pay me to be going to college now, you know, and working my ass off to, to get a degree, but, you, but boy, you, you can't keep the books out of my hand when I'm reading up on a movie that I'm gonna do. What other profession do you have? The reason I respect our profession so much is you have a chance as a director or as an actor to lock people in a room, a dark room, and talk to them for two hours and tell them what you feel about life. You have a chance to enlighten them. You have a chance to maybe prove something or expose something or elevate uh, people's chance to be something of merit. And I, I'm, I'm so uh, disappointed that technology, the advancement of technology, has made people so uh, facile and fast and without depth. And so that uh, people of, of real uh, talent uh, don't use that talent for uh, the betterment of, of the world, as, as you said. That's why I said to those students that I envy them. They're at, the, they're at the, the beginning, the precipice. They're ready. To use that gift, to use that gift in the, in the, in the service of enlightenment, where you can, like I say, sit people in a dark room all over the world for two hours, and they, they have to listen to what you have to say. Where did you study? Well, I studied at the University of Miami. I studied at the Pittsburgh Playhouse. I studied with Uta Hagen. I studied with Lee Strasberg. Then I got invited into the actor's studio. So I studied for about 10 years. Before you, before what? Uh, you got a job? No, I, before I was on Broadway. Uh, I, I, yeah, for 10 years before I was on Broadway, something like that, yeah. And uh, I have a very, very strong opinions about the whole business of studying acting. Um, I think a lot of it is a lot of bull. I think the teachers present themselves way too importantly. I think they, they it's like, it reminds me of being on a Fifth Avenue co-op board where everybody, which I wrote a play about, where, where everybody uh, presents themselves as all knowing and all powerful. And, I, and I, 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 as I look back on it, I don't have fond memories. I. Uh, Lee Strasberg was a big, big supporter of mine, but that doesn't mean I think you, you have to know how to take an imaginary shower. And I certainly don't, without even, I don't want to denigrate anybody by name, but I mean, I spent years carrying imaginary suitcases across the room, opening imaginary windows, and made it, and raised the question about it too, and was threatened to be thrown out quite regularly because I simply asked, why are we doing this? Because I still don't know, and eventually it was dropped. The first college that I went to, they did a play, Joan of Arc, 
And I don't know what in the hell made me wander over and, and, and try to get in that because I had never seen a play. I saw one play. My mother took me to see Bringing Up Father. Uh, but I went over and I got cast in that part. The, the old soldier in, Joan, in the epilogue of St. Joan. And then I, I had no idea I was going to be an actor. And some 12 years later, whatever I was doing, Yeah, whatever I was doing. Oh no, I ended up in a town called Hartford, Connecticut. And it turned out that Hartford, Connecticut had a dazzlingly fantastic community theater. And what I was doing during the day, I was working as an efficiency expert. Now, the first day on the job, I couldn't find the office. So I wasn't cut out to be an efficiency expert. Uh, so I didn't, I, I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. And I heard about this community theater and for some reason I went over. And that, that, that was a great theater, great bunch of people. This is something, where's two? See, where this, where this, this elevator was de dedicated, uh, donated by Gregory Peck. This is totally off limits to us. It's a rare time I've ridden in this elevator maybe four times in my life. <laughs> Can we come in? Yeah, sure. So yeah. This, this is Harold Baldrich with him. I went to school. He's now running the Playhouse. Has been for how many years, Harold? No, well, I think since 1981, which is about 26 years. Good God Almighty. This yeah. is where uh, Sandy Meisner interviewed me. So yeah, I this was Sandy's Meisner. office, yeah. And I was right there, and I was 26 years old, and said, um, am I dreaming? <laughs> I just got the idea like three days before to become an actor from meeting a friend of my first wife's named Zachary Scott in Austin, Texas. And uh, next day after I met him, I flew to New York. You didn't know that, did you? No, did I don't you? think yeah. so, no. And at 26 years old, never acted in my life, and came up came up here, never heard of Sanford Meisner or the Playhouse, but when I got up here, you heard of Sanford Meisner once you got, got to New York. York. Right, yes, of course. Yeah. Probably the best teacher of acting that, uh, in the history of this country. That's right. Probably. Yeah. Here's another picture of uh, somebody who taught you, Martha Graham. Martha Graham. Yes. Who right. invented modern dance. Right. Right. And we were privileged to work with her twice a week which just about broke all of our backs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but all of us remember when, when she would touch us, and we would say, Martha touched us. That's She's a right. 65 year old <laughs> right. woman. Yes. But she was one of the most magnetic people I've ever known in my life, absolutely magical. And uh, I mean, just in, in walking around, never mind on the stage. We're still and, teaching, the, the students here still get the, the yeah. Graham work. Uh -huh. mm. And uh, yeah, she was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So we'll move on. Yeah. You know, Martha Graham was a, was our dance teacher, for God's sake. You know, I, I didn't know who she was, a little tiny little tough woman who scratched my back to make me stand up straight. I, I didn't know, it was Martha Graham. So we, we were the beneficiaries of great teachers, you know. Uh, you know, Kazan, Strasburg, Bobby Lewis, Harold Clerman, Sandy, Stella. There was the, the era of those teachers is not around anymore. There are only a few uh, who are really good who will carry that banner. And we were the, the reluctant beneficiaries of all of those, those wonderful things. Once we learned that, that, it was, that they really knew the truth, I mean, it was like you were hooked. I became hooked very early on. I see no value in that for anyone. To carry an imaginary suitcase across a room, lift an imaginary window, take an imaginary shower. I think the value, the real value of acting class is that you get up in front of people and do scenes. Because that's the main thing. You have to get used to being in front of people. Like I am most relaxed right now because there's a camera on. I'm most relaxed in front of people. I'm not relaxed if there's no one around. Then I'm tense. I've been in front of cameras and audiences my whole life. 
But that's that I, I wasn't like that when I started. I was as nervous as everybody else. But that's the value because I wasn't being hired. So I did scenes and then I did summer stock and I did off Broadway and I did a lot of television. It's the act of performing. But when it comes to teaching acting, I just found, I mean, I, somebody sent me something that Boleslavsky had written and I read it out loud to my son. I said, wow, listen to this. I mean, it just makes you want to quit, tear up every union card and go to bed. I mean, they, it, they, it's, they, they, it's so kind of like mystical and it's not that mystical. You just have to recreate, find a way to function the way we're functioning right now. I'm listening to you and I'm talking. You listen to me and you're talking. And that's essentially it. That's, that's, it's easier said than done. But you can only do it if you have a certain relaxation. That's the purpose of all these scenes. Were you scared to... No, no. I, no I, the first play I ever did, I felt more at home on stage than I did off. And that's I, still true? Yeah. And I connect with the audience. I, I knew before I went out and sat down, it wasn't an ego trip. I knew that they're going to be looking. I'm, we're going to be connected. <laughs> that was the end. That was the feeling I had. You know? And it wasn't ego. It was just, this is, yeah, I'm here and I'm going to be good and blah, whatever. You know? Did you have that feeling in, in social gatherings with that people would, would, be, would listen to you or that you would attract their attention? or? Uh, depending on the social gathering. I know. mean, but this wasn't a new phenomenon to you that, that people would, would gravitate to your behavior. Uh, yeah, I, I always have, uh, I've got a lot of charisma. Who told you that? <laughs> now, a certain and amount a, of bullshit and, will allow And okay? animal. So not, but you're pushing the envelope right now. <laughs> And animal, animal magnetism. Yeah. Uh, those two qualities I, I've depended on. Now, who, who taught you both of those to use them <laughs> in conversation? Do you recall? One I, of the greatest living actors. I, I think it was another actor, Dabney as a matter Coleman. of fact, was in, Dabney Coleman was influenced uh -huh. by my work a lot. Uh -huh. you, you told me that, didn't you? I, I told you that I could see that, that being unemployed as an actor doesn't work so well. So I determined that I would actually work. All right, let's get on. Get it. Jobs let's get career. on. Man. Now then, you know they're all solutions to to something missing in your life, whatever, whether it's directing or acting. They're all alternate universes of some kind. They're all. I know the truth. I want something better, or I know this is the reality, but that's not quite good enough. Or I, I don't want to just live this one life. I want to live a lot of lives, or whatever it is. The question is, which is more satisfying? I don't, there's no way to answer that. That's just a question of your own personality. I mean, what happened to me was I'm technical enough and uh, interested enough in technical things that the overall challenge of trying to understand how to tell a story with the camera and the knowledge of light and optics and architecture and set design and clothes and wardrobe and writing all of that, which went beyond what I was doing as an actor, kind of took over for me. And I never missed acting at all. And I think one of the things that contributed to my being an actor was that whatever I was doing as an efficiency expert was so unsatisfying and I was so bad at it uh, that I was just looking for something else to do. And I don't know when I, oh, I guess it was in Hartford, Connecticut, and I was working as this efficiency expert, and they had this great community theater, uh, the Mark Twain Maskers. That's what they were called. And they had a subscription list. They had people who could build sets. They had a director. And my day began at 5.30 in the, at, in the afternoon when I left the office. But that doesn't mean I was comfortable or anything like that, but I was excited. You know, I just came back from San Francisco about two months ago where I played in, uh, in uh, Elaine May's play for nine weeks. I played uh, the lead in her play with, uh, with Marlo Thomas was in it and uh, uh, there were three one-act plays. I did the first two, and she did the third. 
And it was such a terrific experience to, and frightening to go back into the theater, never mind the movies. Movies somehow is easy because, easier because, you know, you have to do it once and be brilliant and it's over. But to really prepare a, a part where you never stop talking for, for 40 minutes uh, in one of the one-act plays and you never stop talking for 30 in the next one uh, and to worry am I going to remember the lines is my brain being able to going to be able to handle this and am I going to be able to to be successful on the stage and I had it, it was so reassuring to leave Los Angeles to go to San Francisco to play in three one-act plays directed by Elaine May and one was directed by her daughter and have a great time and remind myself of how difficult it is to really be a good actor. I think it should be mandatory for directors to all do that because you get a sense of what really is the truth, how difficult it is to create behavior in front of hundreds of people uh, on a movie set with people putting tape to your nose and lights being adjusted and all of a sudden you're asked to to expose yourself and the, the most intimate secrets that you may have uh, to fill a part because I think that every time you see a great moment, it's because somebody has given you a chance to look in to some very private aspect of themselves that they don't share with very many people. And I, that's why I have uh, really great respect for actors and I revere them because I think it takes a lot of courage to be an actor and to expose those intimate sides of yourself that normally you wouldn't want people to see. Can you learn how to act? Can anyone learn how to act? We all did. I mean, that's a... That's a when the camera's rolling. When the camera's rolling? Yeah. When it counts. Can we all do it? Yeah. Can everyone... Can anyone learn how to act? Can oh, it be taught? No. Uh, uh, now this is a good, I'm glad, now I know, uh, I'll tell you something. Anybody can be a film actor. Anybody. You can take anybody off the street. All right, they go to the bar or, with the, or wherever. Anybody can be a film actor. If the director is good and knows what he knows how to handle them. On film, I'm not talking about Shakespeare and the stage and Greek drama and uh, the classics and Shakespeare, all of that. And nobody off the streets can do that. But they can be, they can play themselves on film. If the director knows, is good with people and likes people. Well, I did a uh, movie uh, after the Heartbreak Kid where the director said to me, I'd like to see you play an existential hero. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, he shows nothing, he reveals nothing. And, I, and I, I thought, well, I just came out of the Heartbreak Kid who was so expressive. I figured I'd be, I could show people I could do nothing, too. And I did. And that wasn't even remotely fun. It was called Eleven Harrow House. It was with James Mason and Sir John Gilgood and um, Trevor Howard. It made it in England. And uh, I wasn't funny in that. So after we finished the movie, because I wrote the shooting script, um, I put in a, a, nar a narrative. And that's where I put the comedy. But the actual performance isn't even intended to be funny because it was an existential hero. Shows nothing, reveals nothing. It should have gotten like uh, John Wayne. Did you? Well, somebody who shows nothing, reveals nothing, you know. Did you, did you, uh, did he catch you trying to be funny and say, no, you know what? No, no, I made no attempt. I mean, in other words. No, I really wasn't even trying to be. It was very straightforward. Right? It was very serious. It was about a diamond robbery. It wasn't supposed to be uh, funny, and I didn't try to do anything like that. And, uh, they, they, you know, actually after that movie, the Variety critic uh, said it would be sad to think an acting career lay ahead. That was the last line of his review. Murph, he's uh, since passed, the variety critic. Did you, were you, why did you take that role, do you remember? Well, I thought it was a big, different, different way to go. I didn't realize it may be a different way to go. It wasn't a good idea. I, maybe I should have just stayed with a good way to go instead of a different way to go. But I went a different way with that, and it was a mistake. Because then, it, it, like, I went from being offered a lot of things to being offered nothing. I remember running into David Selznick's son, Danny, at a party, who actually said to me, 
you know, the feeling in town is though he's, you know, one of these guys that anoints himself. He knows the feeling in town is it'll be hard if we don't see you for a while. That's one movie, Heartbreak Kid, Eleven Harrowha. Then I did same time next year. Then it was okay. I come back. But I mean, that's how that's how brutal it can be. Mo most people, they don't. If they make a movie that doesn't uh, isn't successful, unless you're really established, you never see them again. Where do where do you put yourself in an analytical way of what kind of characterize what kind of director you are? Where, where, uh, you so know, I'm you know, we don't know who invented water, but we know it wasn't a fish. I mean, you can't. It's hard to analyze yourself. It's it's um, everything I know about directing or everything I started with came from acting. It came from Sandy. Now it's, it's been elaborated upon by years of 50 years of doing it, but, 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 but it, it started from acting. So it was like the acting was a seed that got planted and I had to, I had nothing to draw on when I was a director. I was a very unusual weird situation for me because you know directors today are they study they go to directing school or they make movies and they know everything before they start directing I didn't know anything I didn't know which end of a camera to look through I didn't know what a lens was I didn't know what coverage was I didn't know anything I knew how to teach acting that's all I knew so I had to elaborate from that to everything else I had to un I had to after I was already a director. It was, it was on the job training for me. I was already being paid as a director. And I was directing things without knowing what the hell I was doing. So the only thing I had to fall back on was acting. So the same way that I would break down a part uh, to try to find the spine and beats and moments, I would break down a script and try to find the same things and see if I could get from the spine of the scene to a visual style. See if I could extrapolate from the essence of what I thought the scene was about that would lead me to a camera angle as opposed to just arbitrarily saying, oh, this is pretty, or maybe I'll put the camera up high, or maybe I'll put the camera down low, or whatever, that it, that it would come from something the same way that you would find behavior in acting. So I tried to make the same analysis for myself in some way. Um, where the, the, the lessons from acting became the guiding tools. So for me, the directing has always been about finding what I call now an armature. I mean, we used, Sandy used to call it a spine, but, uh, but I think it's more like an armature because I think of an armature as the thing that sculptors use. They take a piece of hanger wire or something and they ball it all up and then they put clay around it. You can't see the armature but it's what's holding the sculpture up. The clay would fall down if it didn't have that little armature in it. And so I, I, I keep looking for this armature in the movie. This is, a, this is one room, this wall was not here. This whole thing went all the way back. This is a 3A, I think this is. That an A on the door, yeah, 3A. And uh, this is where we had like a little bleacher, like two or three level chairs right up here. And David Pressman or Sid Pollock or Marty Owen or Richard Edelman sat right over there and we do improvisations and scenes in this room. This is our first acting class room. Uh, I remember about six weeks into the first year, a stranger came walking in, well-dressed guy, came walking through the, through the door, just with an attitude, and was like, God almighty, who is that? Imposing figure, young man, but imposing as hell. He sat down with Marty Loner, the other teacher, and he says, by the way, this man's gonna be, he just got out of the army, he'll be teaching you starting next week, he's coming back from the army. His name is Sidney Pollock. And, uh, The school will do this to a, to a person. It's uh, such a rich tradition. Never mind the, the 
people, the friends you made in the town, the people you associated with, the people that taught you, but the dedication of, of those teachers and of, of those students. But the big thing, if I, just to get this said, uh, is that you got to walk through all this rejection. I mean, the rejection is unbelievable. And I think the reason I didn't see all these gifted people I studied with is they, they turned around and went home. They didn't know that there was going to be this much rejection. I just took it as a way, well, I got to get better. I got to get better. I got to work more. I got to get better. And by the time I got to audition for a Broadway show, I had been at it for about 10 years. And they couldn't believe that I didn't have all these credits, but I had been working in summer stock and I had a lot of confidence and I just kept going. You have to go through all this stuff and keep in mind that maybe the person rejecting you doesn't know what they're doing. And I, I kind of felt that even very early on. I thought, well, you just made a mistake. You should, have, you should have gotten me. I feel that way. And it's not just about me. I feel that way about other people, too. I say, you could have gotten this person. You didn't get them. You basically, you don't know what they're doing. In fact, when, when we were doing Clifford, I suggested you for the role. And they said, uh, well, it's, you know, it's a Dabney Coleman role. I said, well, then, well, let's get Dabney Coleman. I mean, I actually had a debate about that. They thought there was something strange about getting Dabney Coleman for a role that Dabney Coleman would be excellent at. I mean, it's just so crazy. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> you, know, you remember that story? That's really true. So you, that's a big part of it. You have to understand that a lot of people in, in, in positions of authority don't know what they're talking about. I'm always respectful to people, but that doesn't mean I really think they know what they're doing. Um, just too many times I've seen that they really don't. And I'm, I'm really speaking not so much from, from me as I am from all the terrific actors I see never get a job. So somebody's making a mistake somewhere. And did you get work immediately out here? I got, a, I got an Air Force documentary carrying a stretcher and got in the guild. And then I ended up doing a movie with uh, Greg Palmer and uh, two Westerns back to back up in Utah. And uh, then I did one with Alan Ladd, a Western. I started, I didn't, from then on I worked all the time. Did you, did you feel, it, was there a point where you, where you, Felt like though you took a step up, not only career rise but but uh, 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 artistically. Yeah. What, what do you remember when it was or what it was? Yeah, that was that was uh, exactly. It was Jack Nicholson. He did a movie called Ride the Whirlwind. He uh, wrote it, I think, and uh, or co-wrote it, produced it, and starred in it. And. Uh, I'd been working for, I don't know, 10 years in television. This was, when, when was this? In the 60s, I think. And, uh, or 70s, I don't remember. And he said, Harry, I got this part for you. And, uh, but I don't want you to do anything in it. He said, the guy is Blind Dick Riley. He's the head of a gang of horse thieves. And I'm one of the gang. He's in it too. We're both running the gang. So he's got a patch over one eye and a derby hat on. And he said, just, uh, and that's, don't do it. Let the wardrobe do the character. And I was ready to hear this anyway. I'd been thinking long to play myself totally. Harry Dean Stanton. I didn't give a fuck about Blind Dick Riley, which was my name in the movie. I was Harry Dean Stanton. <laughs> then the patch and everything else. And... What occurred to me, the whole thing opened up for me. What occurred to me was that, and especially playing an authority figure, I'm the head of a gang, a lot of actors or people get uptight playing authority figures. Think they've got to be authoritative and everything like that. And it occurred to me, everybody, the crew, the writer, and the thousands or millions of people hopefully that see the movie, they all know that I'm the head of the gang. So I don't have to prove anything. <laughs> just do what's do the job. Just do the job without trying to throw any weight around. And uh, 
I realized that that, that I didn't have to, I could have been indecisive or whatever I did, I realized it didn't matter what I did, I'm still the head of the gang. <laughs> that dawned on me. And also playing not only authority figures, but heavies, bad guys or killers. They don't think they're wrong. They have no choice anyway. <laughs> and uh, uh, you just play, everybody's got the rage and anger. Everybody's wanting to kill at one time or another. So everybody has that rage. So it opened that up too. Now, does that all that make any sense? <laughs> I, I guess I guess there are uh, categories. There are personality actors. They usually play themselves in the sense that they don't uh, uh, they don't change their voice. They don't do accents. Uh, they don't wear outrageous or unusual costumes. They have a certain kind of personality that is very appealing. People like them. And uh, that's what the the studios expect from them, and that's what the he, the actor gives them. Why doesn't it make sense? Well, I'll I'll tell you why. Because it's somewhere along the line, what what's left out of, of of that, and and you're not the first one to kind of say exactly that, is that somewhere along the line you have to make a choice of which Harry Dean it is. Harry Dean being angry, Harry Dean being friendly, Harry Dean being bored, yeah. Harry Dean being something. And within that, you invent a character that is not necessarily on the page or in the wardrobe or in the makeup. Somewhere or in the patch. It's in me. Somewhere in the line. Somewhere you have to make a decision. I'm going to be pissed off. Yeah. And you're still Harry Dean, but you're pissed off. Yeah, but I... Who gives a fuck? Yeah. You see? See, but you have to make that decision. I don't know who gets it. But it's still fucking me doing it. I understand. I'm saying what's missing <laughs> from an equation to me, from the equation, is where does that thing, where do those, cho where do the choices of which Harry Dean come in? What's that all about? Which Harry well, why, Dean? Oh yeah, which Harry Dean? Harry Dean mad? Harry Dean friendly? It's Harry all, Dean... it's the whole thing. <clears throat> I'm all I'm all of that. Does that does that answer the question? No. I, that's what I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm me when, being but, like that, just like you got. In the, that's the way you get angry. If I get angry. I'm. It's but it's still. I've done all. No, of I understand it. that. I, I, I understand. And everybody in an audience has done the same fucking yeah. thing. I understand that. Everybody has been has gone through all the emotions that you and I go through oh, I when we're that. acting. Do you, do you work from the inside out? Do you, do you actually feel the emotions that you're portraying? Yes. Okay. How do you, how, by, by what method or by what means do, do you find a route? Because, uh, because with all this experience, I find that if somebody's talking to me in a, in a situation of a play or a movie or something, uh, all I have to do is listen to them, and it, it, it happens to me the same way as if it were in life. It, it just happens that way. I mean, I... You know, if I if I would get up and say, uh, you know, uh, you know, where's my dog? You know, I can just get there real quick that somebody's got my my Saint Bernard. I don't care if it's a movie about Beethoven for children. I mean, I'm committed to it because I could just say they've got my dog, and it's just as real. Life isn't that real to me. I find the circumstances of plays and movies realer than life because life is like so unfathomable. It's almost like I can't even grasp what's happening. It's so beyond everything. Was it always so? Was it always easy? Was it always No, easy? no, no. That came with a lot of experience. That came I I couldn't do it at all. First I had to stop shaking. The first five years you have to stop just being nervous. It takes a long time. But but because of just scenes for ten years and, 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 and maybe seventy five plays in summer stock and just doing a lot of things. I mean I've started out paying the Rabbit Run the Theater in Madison, Ohio, $15 a week. I paid them so I could work 16 hours a day. I paid them. I mean, it was just, you know, and, and the, I'm, I'm for, fortunate because I'm tenacious and I get my teeth into I wasn't planning on trying to be rich and famous. I was planning on trying to be good. That's all I was thinking about. How do you get good at this? And a lot of it is just trying to figure it out on your own. It's not like... Uh, 
I don't remember anyone particularly say, I remember Lee Strasberg commenting on something I did when, when I was standing in a scene and I said to the, the, the other person in the scene, well, I'm going to go take a shower now, but I didn't walk away. And he pointed out after, he says, you don't have to be literal. Just because you say something doesn't mean you then turn and walk to the door. But I had done it and he pointed it out just because instinctively I knew that people say things and they say, well, I'm going to go to bed now, but they're still sitting there. So it's kind of just, it's experience, so you just get used to it. Meisner at one point said that it takes 20 years to become an actor. What do you think about that? Uh, I think he's probably underestimating it. Uh, I don't think he's lying at all. It took, it took me 20 years to understand intuitively what the process was, at least 20 years. Um, it doesn't mean you couldn't do it before. It doesn't mean you couldn't take a whack at it. But, um, but to digest it fully and understand it and really comprehend the process and grasp it, it's at least 20 years. But don't you think there are exceptions like, say, a Marlon Brando or something? Is that an exception to you, or do you see Paul in the same? No, he, he, but still, he, you know, Marlon Brando also got better and better. I mean, yeah. uh, he understood more and more and more and more. But, but yeah, no, Marlon, you know, they're geniuses. You know, Orson Welles was a better director in his first movie than I'll ever be in my entire life, no matter what I do. It's just, that's just something, that's just a fact. I mean, uh, Citizen Kane was, it's just not something that mortals do. It just isn't. And I don't care how hard I worked or what I did, I would never be able to do it. And that's not being coy, that's just the truth. Now, I don't know where that comes from, but it does come. I mean, there are geniuses and you, you, can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't worry about that because we're not that, most of us. Those are, there are a few of those guys and that's it. That's, that's their lot in life and, 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 and they're geniuses. There's nothing you can do about it. But I'm not talking about geniuses. I'm talking about people that, you know, aspire to be good at something and feel they have skill for it and want to work at it. There are some people who, who like to dramatize things and other people who don't. And the people who enjoy behavior are, are most likely to be good actors. People who will say, as I once, I was interviewing some children for a picture I made called Cinderella Liberty, uh, which you may remember. <laughs> And uh, since you were in it, she, um, I mean, the, these kids came in one at, one at a time. And, and I, you know, I, you don't read a kid because the kids have been rehearsing with their mothers and they, they have the lines down perfect and just the inflections. And you don't learn anything about an actor that way. So I would do things, I would ask them questions that uh, I remember asking this boy who finally played the part. Where, where do you live, I said. He says, well, I live in X place. I said, and, and do you have your own room? He said, yes. He was kind of stunned, expecting me to ask him to read the scene that he'd been preparing. I said, uh, is there a window in the room? He said, yeah. I said, well, uh, what do you see out the window? And he went like this. He said, well, I have this, this, this terrific tree out there. And I saw him start to dramatize the feeling of the tree. I said, it's, it's full of leaves and it's the wind. And I, I knew immediately that this was a kid who enjoyed behavior, who understood the, intuitively what it means to be an actor. You know, what's the, the thing about an actor, what's, what's the most satisfying thing is after the guy says action and you are acting, there are those rare moments when you are not aware of Peter Falk. You are so, yeah, I don't know how to say it, but you've become one with the character that you're playing. You know when, when people take photographs of each other, everybody's experienced how suddenly, how self-conscious you get. You can't smile as easily, you know. You're nervous because of the camera. Actors are the same way. When they say action, man, you, uh, you're aware of yourself. You, 
And those few times when I'm no longer Peter Falk, I no longer hear myself talking. I'm no longer conscious of the fact, oh, I raised my arm. That's all been obliterated. I'm suddenly the person that I'm playing. Now, you can't carry that too far. I mean, if you're playing Napoleon and you think you're Napoleon, they could take you away, you know? <laughs> you know? So I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I'm just talking about those uh, rather rare moments during a take when you no longer hear the line that you just said, when you're no longer aware of the fact that you just moved your arm, and you've become one with the character, and you, Peter Falk, disappeared. The level of reality is what it's all about, that, that you're with the person. And I, I remember when I first started to work, I, would, I was doing westerns. I was a villain in westerns in Hollywood. And uh, I would go in there, and uh, they were real happy when that audition was over because I brought so much uh, animosity to the reading that they were glad I was out of the room. I got, they gave me the part, but get them out of here. So the reality level is really what it's about. I mean, and, you know, and, the, the, and what you have to do is, you first of all, you have to know your lines, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You can't be thinking about your lines. And too many people I've worked with in movies and anywhere else, they're looking at their script before they go on. You can't do that. You really have to, I, I, I just spent, enormous amount of time on that I'm, and, and the two actors that I, I remember uh, it was really uh, De Niro and Ellen Burstyn they were the ones that they would run those lines not not to see how you were going to do it just to know them just to get them out of the way and then when, then you can do what you want to do so the tremendous amount and I say this to my son who's a young actor and my daughter that you cannot be too prepared just knowing the material then when you get out there it frees you to do whatever you want to do mostly listen to the other person and not what, what, think in your mind, what do I say after this? You just have to put in that, that work, and a lot of people don't do it. I, uh, I, I made a speech that I had a play running last year in New York, and I, I said to the cast, you know, there's not, there's not a dearth of talent, there's a dearth of opportunity, and here's an opportunity. It was my way of saying work harder. You had to work harder. You couldn't be going line, line, when you're going to be opening in, 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 in a day or two. You know, some directors, some of the English directors, they want you to know the lines first day of rehearsal. A lot of the American actors, they just wouldn't even want to get near that. They said, no, I have to find the... Well, we're not talking about your interpretation. We're talking about mastering the lines. You can do anything you want once you, once you got them. We took singing in the first year. And um, our singing teacher taught us kind of how to produce a sound that most of us didn't have any clue that we had in them, in us. And I think maybe the first thing I ever did was sing a song on this stage, on this stage. I think it was singing. I remember I had to started the song off stage and it was, and I shocked myself. There's a bright golden sun on the metal, that, that uh, Oklahoma thing. And uh, let me do that again. Yes, bright golden what? There's a bright golden, there's a bright golden haze on the meadow, acting and singing and all this stuff. And I was just singing, I thought, is this me? Is that voice coming out of me? <laughs> but it was totally shocking and surprising and uh, uh, never did much with it, but uh, at least I could make a sound that I had no clue of. And all, all of us discovered that we had something in there that we had no idea existed. I think that's the first thing I did on this stage, first year. The directors, too, I learned a lot from, I worked, I've been fortunate enough to work with some of the top directors in the business over the years. And um, Alfred Hitchcock <laughs> had a saying, did I tell you that about him? He had, had a scene where me and this kid, Tom Pittman, who got killed in a Porsche later, and, and E.G. Marshall, we were having a scene where we kidnapped in E.G., me and this other kid, tied him up, and there's a lot of dialogue. We go up to Hitchcock, and he says, uh, you fellows go down there and work it out. <laughs> he, didn't, he wasn't even, we, we did the whole scene on our own, 
rehearsed it on our own. And of course, when he saw it, he might say, but you come in a little earlier, maybe. Or, but I, I'm not even sure he said that. But the fact he trusted all of the actors, man. I've heard stories they didn't like actors. That's bullshit, man. I think that there's been a big, big confusion for years about theater and film. And that the purpose of all theater rehearsal is to wean the actor's dependence on the director because the only time it counts, the only time it counts, the director is absolutely 100% useless. Of no help whatsoever, cannot do anything. Turton goes up, the actor's on his own. It's precisely the opposite in the film. Everybody else has gone home. Everybody's on other movies, including the cameraman. The only person that's either got what they want or not is me. And the only person that knows how it's supposed to go is me because we don't go in order. We don't go in sequence. We do a minute and a half of film a day. It would be if I, as though I put, told you to put your hand on a record and slow it down to where it sounds like that. And then say, do you think that's pretty? Do you think that's going to be pretty when it gets sped up? And you have to make that judgment call. The second thing is that there is no such thing ever in the world in film as a performance. There is only rehearsal. There isn't any such thing. All I have to do is say one more. There isn't a performance. It's all a rehearsal. So I don't rehearse in a formal way very much. I rehearse very little in a formal way and I rehearse on the camera, with the camera. Because you don't know, you don't have to know what you did in film, and you don't have to repeat it. You have to do it, and I have to catch it. That's all that has to happen. And then we're on with it to the next beat. So sometimes it's better for me to have a slightly insecure actor who hasn't got roots planted in the ground, where I can't move them where I need to move them, uh, and I'd rather, I'd rather be able to move them a little bit, where I have now spent a year daydreaming the movie, and I think I know I'm now in the third act, and we've started the first week in the third act, and I feel like I know where that place is because we haven't had a chance to run it. In a, in a, in a theater, you've got four weeks to rehearse, or five weeks to rehearse. You can go way off and then get back the spontaneity again. Now, I will not say for one moment that I'm right or that I'm wrong. I'm, I'm right for me. There are other great directors. Sidney Lumet rehearses everything, the camera angle, the angles. He does terrific movies. They are films of what he's already worked out. I, I don't have the mind to do that. I would be bored silly shooting the film. If I worked everything out and I knew everything and where every camera angle is, then I would just be recording everything that I've already done for me. I'm, I'm working the film as I'm making the film. I'm finding the film and I'm working the film with the actors and trying to kind of find it. So I don't, I don't like to rehearse as much as actors like to rehearse. And I often have very unhappy actors as a result. Can we rehearse this, please? Can we rehearse this, please? Can we rehearse this, please? Yeah, yeah, and I lie a lot. Yeah, we'll go to tomorrow. We'll rehearse, and uh, then I don't rehearse. There are times when, under pressure, you have to tell an actor, "Look, it goes this way. This is the way it goes." You know, I once was watching a television show, and uh, I don't remember the name of it, but it was an interview with a conductor, a symphony <coughs> conductor. A short guy was conductor of the Chicago Symphony, and the interviewer said, um, "What is what does a conductor do? What is, you know, what is all that? What what, do you, what does a conductor do?" And this conductor looked at him and he says, "The conductor tells him how it goes. This is the way it goes, and you do that for a hundred people on, in a symphony orchestra, and you do it hopefully um, with the same skills, so that the the musicians or the conductors don't feel that their their personality has been taken away from them 
you, you guide them toward the truth that as you see it. And hopefully you make them think that they thought of the idea when it, you've been planting it and pl planning it for the whole time. But if it's their idea, if they think it's their idea, they'll own it in a different way than if you give them the reading. It's a political situation, you know, it's, it's, it's psychological. You have to, you, you, part of being a director is, is being a psychologist, understanding how, how to get the best from people. You want them, they all want to give you their best. You have to be a kind of like a gardener, you know, you're, you're fertilizing, you're, you're, you're sprinkling water and, 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 and you're helping the garden to grow. And the, one of the ways to make a garden grow is to make everybody feel like they belong, they deserve the part, that you're thrilled with them, you appreciate them, you, you, you're affectionate to them, and, you're, and you have to lubricate their efforts to be great. And I'm going to benefit that way. But I, I, I say this about acting, that maybe the average person could understand this better, that when you're acting with people, for instance, you, if you and I are acting, or for instance, if I'm acting with Cassavetes or Ben Gazzara, and we all know each other, and we're all comfortable with each other, and we all like each other, that goes a long way to doing what you just talked about. If you have to laugh, it's a genuine laugh, and if you, if you get irritated, <laughs> it's a way to be irritated. And um, John is a director. I mean, uh, he would do anything to get you off of your self-consciousness. I mean, if he had to drop his pants and put a banana up his rear and run in front of you what, while you were doing it, he would do that. It wasn't uh, that uh, quiet, quiet on the set, please, quiet! And now you can hear a pin drop and something, uh, Camera, boy, action! By now you're so goddamn nervous, for Christ's sakes. I mean, you're not human anymore. Uh, so when you're acting with people that you know and people that you like, it's much looser and you're closer to the real thing. I would, I would, uh, you know, I've never taught acting. I, I, I don't, I don't want to really. What I have to say is so simple. But, but I would, uh, I would, I would really defer. I'd get out of the way more as a teacher. I would, I would really. Somebody would do something. I would say, why don't you just go ahead and do it again? Do it another time. And then maybe by the third or fourth time, they'll start getting a little more comfortable with it. And the fourth time will be better than the first time. And that way, they'll learn. Well, I'm more comfortable, and and that's a good way to learn what you need to do. You need to be so solid that you're, you know, I could probably do, and you could probably do in, in the first take uh, now, which might in the past have taken us a while to get there. But for for young people studying, I think you got to get out of their way as teachers, and and let them let them do it, and let them experience it, and don't say anything that is going to bring them down. And, 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 and just basically, it's really about try to function the way you do in life. Easier said than done, but that's what the goal is. Just, just sit here and listen to what the other person is saying, and that will provoke you to respond in whichever way you're going to re uh, respond. No, you keep learning. You really do. That's the good thing about it is you, 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 I do learn on every picture. I do learn on every picture, whether I'm acting or directing. I do learn something. Or learn it better than I knew before I did that particular picture, but I've never found a secret. Uh, that I can think of. What now. what was? Uh, I mean, we're about done. But but what was? Uh, if I say Sean Penn, what comes to your mind? Um, just the complete immersion into a character and a kind of what Sandy used to call actor's faith. Uh, it's just an ability to dive totally and completely into a character and without any degree of vanity ever. He doesn't, he doesn't worry about how he looks or whether he's heroic or uh, that's not what 
he worries about the reality of the character. He, he, he comes to the set with his, with his head screwed on in the right way. He's not an easy guy. He's a formidable guy to deal with. Brilliant, brilliant at his, at his job. And, and opinionated, like Hackman. You know, I mean, Hackman spends most of his life hating directors because he doesn't think they know as much as he does. And unfortunately, he's right. You know, now, when you get an actor like that, you shut up. I mean, I didn't say anything to Hackman when I directed Hackman. I didn't have to. I, had one, I think I gave him one direction the whole time. And he mentioned it in the newspaper. He said, I worked with Sidney Pollack, never said a word to me. But he was trying to compliment me. It didn't seem much like a compliment at the time. It sounded like I was a dummy. But, the, but, but you know, there are certain actors you just got to keep out of their way. Uh, casting is 85% of the job a director does. That's, if you want to know the real secret, that's the secret to directing, is casting. If you do movies like I do, if you're not doing special effects movies or you know, certain kind of thriller kind of movies, if you're doing character-driven acting movies, which is mostly what I do, then my job is done, 85% done with the casting. It really is. Uh, and I, I have to do as much to stay out of the way of, of, of the, if, if, if there's the right connection between the, between the, it's two things. It's the level of skill, but it's also the way in which the actor sees the world that is or isn't congruent with the character that, that they're playing. I mean, you know, some actors believe they can play a character and then don't know that they can't. They just can't. Uh, and sometimes the, there's a terrible, horrible moment on a movie where you realize you've miscast someone. And you have to make a decision. Are you going to fire them and you know redo what you do, or are you going to try to make it, you know, beat them into it in some way? And, uh, but but casting is a big big part of it. You know, I had the privilege of introducing Catherine Hepburn and Henry Fonda. You think that they would have no, they would have known each other, you know, but uh, they didn't. They never met. And we were at 20th Century Fox, and I came down. I, I don't, even, I don't remember if you were there at that moment, but it was in the basement of 20th Century Fox, and I said, I had the privilege of saying, uh, "Henry, Mr. Fonda, this is Catherine Hepburn. Catherine, this is Henry Fonda. This <laughs> something I'll remember forever." My God, she was great. Yeah. She was great. She, all she needed was, sometimes she was wrong. She would choose the wrong thing to do, uh, which never happened with Henry Fonda. He was, you know, the perfect miniaturist. She would be a little out of control every once in a while, and I would have to whisper things in her ear and make her calm down and maybe focus a little more. But she was... Can you super. remember a specific example of that? I can. When Henry came home from the forest, having been lost in the forest, he makes a confession to her of what's disturbing him and says, she says, what's the matter? And she says, I, I couldn't find my way and all that. And she comes over to him and says, uh, we're going to climb on that horse, and right? Well, she did it the way I just did it. You're going to climb on that horse and want to go? I said, I said, Kate, I think it's, uh, it's too much. Maybe try this adjustment. Whisper it in his ear. Plant it like you're planting a seed. You know? And so she leaned over and she went, I gotta go on that force. I'm gonna go, go, go. And, you know, it made the moment. And she, but she was capable of doing it immediately. She knew immediately that I was right, and that I had made the right choice for her, because she had a tendency to be all over the place. But if she if focused, she was superb. Superb. Hi. Hello. How are you? Well, how are you? Are you guys working yet? Not yet. Okay. So this is the dance. The dance room. Martha Graham, we're 
Pearl Lang taught us ballet, Martha Graham taught us modern dance, and uh, we just learned the basics of modern dance, and mo mostly how to move in a theatrical way. Martha Graham would teach us posture and attitude and attitude, it was an inner energy which she had in space at age 65. And an incredible woman, incredible human being. Coming across the floor and from there to there and something like that. Jimmy Kahn, Jimmy Kahn with those shoulders, with those shoulders, Jimmy Kahn coming across. <laughs> How's that again? Jimmy, Jimmy Kahn. His shoulders, the broadest shoulders ever. He walked, Jimmy. This is Jimmy. Do it walking this way. Jimmy Kahn. I could have been more famous, I could be more famous now, be richer, and and being playing leads too. But I'll tell you why. <laughs> but there's proof of it. I did this movie with John Carpenter called Christine. And after I, was, I did a couple of scenes, he called me and said, I want to talk to you about something. So he calls me, I, I said, what? And he said, well, I said, don't do that to me. Is it about work? And he said, yeah. We get together. He said, we want you to do a series playing a PI, a private investigator. And I don't know whether it was John or one of the producers. They were the Mary Tyler Moore people, the top television people. He said, you will have more money, you will be more famous, and you will get more pussy on camera and off than you've ever got in your life. Now this is, and I'm thinking this is like an offer from the devil, <laughs> but by the same token, I've got a career of playing leads and women and the whole thing. He said, I'll write the first three. He said, then later on you can be, you'll be involved in the casting and the writing, and you can later on direct if you want to. This was offered every actor in the fucking business. So this is, and I said, I'll think about it. And I said, shot myself right in the foot. Why? <laughs> I don't, again, there's no answer to it. I start thinking, well, I'm neurotic, I'm not giving, I'm manal retentive, I'm uh, this, I'm that. Uh, um, why didn't I take this? I think, yeah, I'm offering what every actor dreams for, his own series with women, a lot of money, playing the lead, directing, involved in the writing and the casting. This whole fucking career was offered to me, and I'm just realizing it at this moment, more so than I ever have. And, uh, and I, I said, I'll think about it, and then I, it, it just, I, I didn't respond to it. And I didn't, I didn't want to do all that work. This is how this uh, um, psychosomatic organism reacted to the situation. And I don't, again, don't want to sound high flown and metaphysical about it, but that's the reality of it. It just happens. And I don't know why, and I can't start feeling guilty about it that I turned down all of this. You know, talent, talent has a destructive side to it. I mean, t t talent comes from trouble. I've said this before, and, uh, and, and it's the truth. I mean, it, there is no such thing as a non-neurotic, talented person. Liquefied. Well, that's what Sandy used to say. It was, it was liquefied trouble. Liquefied in the sense that, that if it's pure, if it's just trouble and it gets trapped, it becomes neurosis. It doesn't, it has nowhere to go but to express itself in a, in, in a way that's troublesome. But if it, if it, if it, can become fluent sometimes that passes into your imagination and you're able to see the world in ways that other people can't see the world coming from this neurotic behavior or this neurotic point of view or this troubled thing. It's all, 
it's all about dissatisfaction. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. I mean, otherwise, why not just go live your life? What's the big deal? Why do you have to make up something? My God, eat a real ice cream cone. You know, don't go on the stage and pretend you're eating an ice cream cone. What the hell's the point of that? It has to represent something better than the real ice cream cone. And the, the thing that makes it better is your dissatisfaction with the real ice cream cone. And that's neurotic. That's coming from some kind of trouble. It is, I, 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 don't, I see this whole life here and I'm not quite happy with it. Something's wrong. And so there's a destructive part of that too. And it depends on your own handling of that part of it, you know, whether you let it get the best of you or whether you let the other part get the best of you. And we've seen a lot of careers, uh, you know, I mean, they end in alcoholism, they end in drug abuse, they end in total self-destruction and divorce after divorce after divorce and suicides. And people that great actors that end up their careers in, you know, nowhere. I mean, directors too. It's not, it's not a one-way street, you know, being talented. It's, it's, um, it's got an upside and a downside. And, you, you know, you have to try, try to get a hold of the upside and, and try to be on the lookout for the downside and, and, and watch where it's leading you. You know, it's, I mean, I've seen a lot of careers destroyed. I've been doing this a long time. And, and I started out with several close friends even who, you know, had big careers and it's, I watched them go haywire. And, and he, when I was a kid, my heroes that I'd meet late in life who were already falling apart, you know, drinking and could hardly get them together to say five lines on the set, you know. Uh, guys that I grew up watching on Broadway when I started directing television would hire them and see they're just destroying themselves. Again, withdrawn, but then I have to get arrived to the point where I say, well, I had nothing to do with it. It all just happens. Nobody's in charge. I have to accept all of that, all of my past, all of the times I've tur turned down great opportunities. Bob Dylan, I sang with Bob Dylan, you know, we went out and recorded together. And he came to me and said, you want a tape of the recording? And I said, no. Why? <laughs> these kinds of things, and I, I don't want to sound self-indulgent or an ego trip, but I see, I, I see the whole picture, my, the, all of this that's happened to me, and your life, and your life, everybody's life here, everybody's life. It's all just one big phantasmagoria of uh, happening. It's like one big fucking movie with no answer to it, and it's just going on and on, and I'm trying to relax behind that, and it makes me laugh. <laughs> At the moment, <laughs> it's, that, that's why I think it reminds me. I feel like a Buddha on it. Was you see all these Buddha statues? They're all smiling. I'm saying, what are they smiling? At? I said, maybe this is it. <laughs> They're just watching the whole thing and laughing. Well, we know we know that you're. Uh, do you look at yourself more of a writer or as an actor or as equal? Or well, I'm not. I'm not uh, that that interested in, in being an actor anymore. I, um, as you know, you just did a reading of one of my plays, and I wasn't even there. And uh, I haven't told anyone this yet, and I, I I hope I can get. But I've got John Lithgow committed to doing another of my plays. He wants to open it in London. I haven't told him yet that I won't be there. But it, go ahead and you know. Is I've got a good director and I work on a script and they can they can call me. I'm not I'm not that interested in acting anymore. But if a, a role came along that for whatever reason you couldn't uh, you couldn't refuse, would you do you think that you would be as dedicated in the work process as? Oh, you there's are? no question about that. I'm in a movie right now where. Uh, uh, oh yeah, I, I give everything I have. I'd be no other way to do it. I just don't want to do it. And I'll tell you why. It's the amount of time. Uh, at the job, I most everything I do is from home, so I don't want to have to travel. Even though this movie I did was shot in around New York, it still took about an hour and a half, two hours to get there, and a couple hours getting home, and ten, eleven, twelve hours on the set. When I finished, they said, "Would you take a deal where you get six hours?" Because they do do that for some, you know. I, I don't see myself doing it. I'm I'm more interested in other things. Uh, I'm just more compelled in another direction at this point. 
And uh, what would happen would uh, today, at my age, would be the same thing that happened when I was 30 years old. And that is you would, couldn't wait to get to the theater. And you couldn't wait for that curtain to come up. And then after doing it for a month, you're saying, let me out of here. <laughs> I don't want to go say those lines again. That's the problem with doing a play. The idea of doing the same thing every night for a year, that's, uh, that doesn't grab me. But the excitement of the rehearsal period, the excitement of oh, opening night, oh, that's great. And the first two or three months on the stage, it's great. And you know the laugh is going to come, and there it is, and that's all very satisfying. I mean, I never was a comfortable director, I mean, in terms of being confident about material. Um, always, you know, there's certain um, personalities, and I'm one of them, that tend to be pessimistic about my own work, but also there are certain jobs where optimism is not a help. I mean, you don't want an optimistic air traffic controller. It's just really not a very good idea. Oh, these planes will be okay. You, you got to go over here, go over here. I mean, I would rather have a guy who's worried that there's going to be a crash every time they take off, and that's the way I direct. Okay, what's going to go wrong on this one? Where am I going to screw this up? Because it goes wrong most of the time. I mean, it's very hard to make a good movie. It's really hard, and you can't hit a very high batting average, and you don't. You know, I've done 20 movies, I've done maybe five good ones, and five, you know, old mediocre ones, and seven or eight bad ones, or whatever. It's just the way it goes. It doesn't go any better than that. I mean, unless you're Spielberg or somebody like that, or Wilder, or some of those guys that we're talking about. But, yeah, sure, every time I go to work, I feel like, you know, there's a disaster brewing here. Where is it? What do I have to look out for? And here... Here's our, here was our lounge, and a little Irish lady, you see like her name, Peggy, yeah, Peggy, she used to make coffee for us or whatever over here, and we, there's a couch here, and I remember around Thanksgiving, so about seven, eight weeks into the school, and Jimmy Conn was up, we were between classes, and I was lying on his couch over there, and we were talking, and I said, I said, we're talking about dreams or something. And I said, you know, I just realized I haven't dreamt about anything. This is for six or seven weeks. Anything but acting for seven weeks. Nothing but acting. Every night. And nothing else but acting. And everyone just stopped. The room got very, very quiet for a second. They said, me too. That's why we were just possessed with it, possessed to it. It was six, I don't know, it was six days a week or five days a week, but it was eight hours here at school, and then we'd go home and do improvisations for another two or three hours. So it was like it was like 10, 12 hours a day, and every day, and and that was it. It was just, and we were just all of us, all of us, dedicated to this, and all learned this, the, the tradition of the, of the theater and about responsibility and preparation, and and and, and just to honor the theater it became our church. As one of our teachers, Marty Loner, used to say, someone was smoking a cigarette in his class, and he says, "Put that cigarette out," and she says. Oh, why? He says, this is my church. He says, this is my church. He said, I wouldn't smoke in your church. You're smoking in my, in my church any minute. Great guy, Marty Loner. Marty Kai Loner. Great teacher. And, uh, I can see all those people in here. Jimmy Conn, rousting everybody, knocking into everybody, knocking them around. And, Great guy, wonderful, wonderful guy, terrific actor. Wow. I remember going to Fire Island one day with Freddie Beer, late Freddie Beer, and we were on a boat <clears throat> going to Fire Island. There was Sandy, and we were. I was a first year student, and I'm, I'm so nervous. And if Sandy minds, or, and we're, they're, they're waiting for him on the dock. Were, was Cobb and Strasburg and Kazan and all these people were waiting for him and, and he invited us to the beach to and when I sat there at the beach waiting for pearls of wisdom from these people as they sat around and what did I hear? I heard things like, well, it's hot. <laughs> oh, have you got a towel? 
you know, and I was so disappointed because I expected to be to, to be listening to War and Peace or something. They were only people, but they were the they were the right people and they were on the right road. And I'm grateful for all of them. Sweetheart, where have you been?